faith-based member-supported organization. Um, we started back in 2018 with the idea of, of education. How do we connect experts to stakeholders so we can make informed decisions and help the industry grow? Um, we are, uh, like I said, member supported. I want to give a big shout out to uh, Harris Beach Law Firm. Uh, they're our sponsoring member. Um, you know, we have a bunch of individual and business memberships. All those funds help support us move forward and keep doing this. Um, we got a bunch of volunteers who are helping in the background to put on the, and organize these events and really uh, are here to support the community. So we want to ask questions to everyone who's out there to, to better understand how we can support um, you know, this industry and this community that's growing. Um, we have about 15 people on call right now, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be getting some more in. So I am your host, Zach Sarkis, and I, my co-host is Jacob Fox. He's a member of Hemp Lab and has been with us from the start. I'll let Jacob say hello for a second. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Zach. Um, my name is Jacob Fox. I run a business uh, called Closed Loop Systems, and we uh, design, build, and operate uh, large-scale vermicomposting facilities. Um, so that's what I do as my main business. And then on the side, I also uh, am planting 30 acres of industrial hemp uh, fiber variety this year. Um, so I'm really curious uh, about this conversation and really excited to uh, talk. Thanks, Zach, for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, and so in no particular order, um, our, our panelists today are, uh, we got Stephen Halton. He's based, he runs a company called Central New York Processing. He is one of the leaders in New York State with regards to fiber processing production. He's an entrepreneur. He's a farmer. Got, got some really great insight. Um, I'll let him introduce himself in, in a moment. Um, we got Jared Nelson, Dr. Jared Nelson, who's a professor at SUNY New Pulse. Um, I met Jared a couple of years back now and really just blown away by his team, uh, a group that he's working with, looking at the implementation and utilization of fiber for industrial use from an engineering perspective. Um, and we got Dr. Jen Jenkins. Um, she has also been at the forefront of this industry from some of the first seeds been planted in New York State. Uh, she's a professor at SUNY Morrisville, um, and she's, uh, you know, leading the way from an education perspective as well as uh, from the farming community. So we got some really awesome perspective that really can take the fiber uh, production from seed all the way through production to sale. And uh, it's going to be a great conversation. So let's, uh, we'll launch out to, to Steve and I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, we'll go from there. Well, uh, thanks Zach. Thanks for having me here. Um, you know, uh, yeah, like you said, I, I've got the agricultural background. I started a, a farm business back in 2011, I think it was. I don't know. I can't even keep track of the years now. Um, I wanted to grow uh, fiber just, you know, just like Jacob did, well, does. And, um, you know, but I, I fast realized that it was important for me to help build the industry and build infrastructure for that. So um, I founded CNY Hemp Processing in 2017. Uh, you know, we... Uh, primarily focus on grain and fiber, uh, gearing a little bit more towards the fiber end. Um, you know, we've just moved into a 12,000 square foot facility in New Woodstock, just outside Casnovia, uh, about 20 minutes away from Syracuse. And uh, just really excited for the growing season as long as the pandemic doesn't uh, slow too many things down. Mm. Great. Um, yeah, Jared, I'll let you take it, take it from here. Yeah, you bet. Um, Zach, Jake, thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. And uh, um, yeah, it was, uh, I, I remember that first conversation we had, Zach, uh, back in the day. And actually, Jacob, I think you were on that call as well. Um, and uh, it was just uh, an exciting realization of how many uh, synergies there were um, in, in what we we're trying to do. And so that's, uh, it's, it's fun to be here uh, today. Um, so I am actually a composite materials uh, specialist. I've been working in and around the composite materials industry um, for the better part of 20 years now. Uh, and so I'm really interested in fiber reinforced plastics. And that's where my, uh, my research for my PhD and master's degrees have been in addition to a lot of my industry experience. Um, as, fin as I was finishing up my PhD, I had the fortunate opportunity uh, to be working alongside a gentleman who um, went and started a, a, a natural fiber company. I won't mention his name because um, he's arrogant and I don't want him to, you know, get word that I'm talking about him. Um, but uh, he, he 
uh, pulled me into a project to start looking at bamboo fibers. Um, and that really kind of opened my eyes to, uh, you know, not only looking for natural, re uh, natural um, replacements for uh, fiber reinforcements, but also really kind of opened my eyes to look at, at uh, what is sustainability. Um, and so that's really what, uh, what brings me, uh, what gets me excited about this research is what opportunities exist and how can we attain them uh, sustainably. So I'm um, looking forward to people's questions today. And uh, again, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, of course. We we'll appreciate you having you being here, Jared. Jen, I'll send it over to you. I'm less verbose than Jared. Um, so I'm Jen Gilbert Jenkins. I'm the Ag Science Professor at SUNY uh, Morrisville. And uh, we've been growing hemp for this will be our fifth growing season this year. I focus on grain and fiber. Uh, we also have CBD grows on our campus, but that's mostly in the horticulture department. And so I, from an agronomy standpoint, love fiber hemp. I love how it fits into our growing season and what it can do for crop production in the state. So that's, that's where my interest is. Awesome. Yeah, so as everyone can see, we got a really well-rounded group here. And um, I think I'm actually going to open, send out a poll to everybody. Um, just take a second to, to check it out. Uh, just to get an idea of where people are coming from. And, um, you know, there's just a couple multiple choice answers. Because um, again, we're trying to understand who the community is and how we can best serve. Uh, we'll, we're going to start the conversation off just a little back and forth. And, um, you know, we got some questions already listed for each of the panelists. But then we really want to hear from those who are in attendance. Uh, we got 23 people on this call already. And I bet you more people are going to keep on coming in. So once the Q&A opens, that's going to help us facilitate the conversation. If there's anything we're missing, flag it, send it our way, and we'd, we'd love to have that inspire this conversation. Um, so it's fun to think where to begin, because there's, uh, you know, there's the end of the road, which is exciting through the material processing center. There's the growing and processing itself, and then there's also the education and research of what we're seeing. Um, I think we really do want to start with what's going in the ground and how we're advising or connecting to farmers. Um, so you said that, Steve, you got a project going on. You, you, you were talking about investing in a space and building out production. Um, what's that look like? And from a planting perspective, what are we looking at for this year um, with, with regards to what you're doing and partner, farms that you're partnering with? Well, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I see that there's a huge need for the fiber industry, um, whether it being textiles or, or bioplastics or, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's well, 50,000 uses, 25,000 uses, however we want to put it. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of potential really for that fiber, fiber niche. Um, and that's why I saw the importance to kind of expand on the, uh, the fiber processing. Uh, we've been working on a, a prototype decorticator, uh, which hopefully will be in production soon. So we can test that out for the material harvested for this, uh, this growing season. Um, you know, we, uh, like I mentioned, we just got a 12,000 square foot facility. Um, also looking into the possibility of another location uh, west of us uh, to hopefully be able to help build that infrastructure a little bit more. Um, you know, it's, I, I really think that fiber is the way to go. I mean, if, if you look at, I'm not trying to put down CBD or anything, but I, when you look at the profit margins as far as, you know, how much it costs to put it in the ground to how much profit you can make off of that, that crop, um, you'll see that it costs so much less than, than CBD and you already have traditional farm equipment that you can harvest that with. Um, so I, I think in a lot of ways it could help save agriculture, uh, not just in New York State, but in the Northeast. Um, been a lot of great collaboration that we've been working on with a lot of great people in the industry. You know, I, I really got to thank Jared and, and Jen because we've, we've done so much together. Um, and, I, and I'm looking forward to this growing season. Um, it's it's been a little tough because with uh, with the current pandemic, um, you know, it's it, it's hard to see what the foreseeable future is going to be. So I kind of told a few people to take their time, you know, not jump in. A lot of people want to go at about 100 to 200 acres of growing fiber. Um, I usually tell people to start with 20. But for the most part, I've kind of said, you know, why don't we just take 2020 to take a look at what's going on and uh, do a little bit more research. You know, I mean, I, I'd love to get into making masks or biofilters or uh, non-woven uh, filters for, for masks. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of potential for, for opportunities that, that could, 
you know, I mean, I, I hate to see anybody get sick from, from COVID, but, uh, you know, any way that we could save or, or help people or help agriculture in general, general, that's what we're shooting for. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of talk about that and exciting. So a couple of big questions I got pulled out of there that may, for us, it's common language, but what is a decorticator and what is fiber? Uh, Jen or Jared, when you want to take that for a spin? I'll, I'll talk about, uh, well, Jared, you want to talk about what's, what's fiber and I'll do the decorticator side because that's your... Um, it's your fabulous drawing that I always refer to. Sure. Um, so, um, actually, I was thinking maybe it made sense to do this the other way around, Jen. Maybe you talk about. Uh, uh, we work so well together. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the stalk of the plant is made up of two different structures mainly. You've got the outer bast fibers that is more stringy and what you're thinking of, the material that's going to become uh, traditionally things like rope, right? And then we have the inner material and that's, um, I like to compare it to balsa wood. It's like a, a spongy material and that's also a fiber that's called the herd, the herd fiber. And so the stalk of the plant, you can, um, you can get two different materials out of the herd fiber and the bast fiber. And so the decorticator separates the two. Right. Yeah, and so I think that uh, the the one piece I would I would want to add to that is, um, you know, there's the from a language standpoint, I think a lot of times decortication gets mixed in with the word separation, um, and there's not a clear delineation between those two things. Um, I think that the way um, that the language that Jen and I have been have been using, and I I think Steve is is in the same boat. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but uh, um, decortication is the sep is basically separating out the fiber from the herd, and then separation is then taking, for example, that outer bast fiber um, and uh, getting that down to a, a smaller um, individual fiber or smaller fiber bundles than you might initially get when you um, when you first decorticate that. That do okay with that, you guys? I speak yeah. speak for you well enough. Yeah, I, I usually just call a decorticator a fiber extractor. That's the easiest way to put it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I like that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, fiber extractor. That that's definitely a simple way to put it. And how do I'm we gonna get... keep saying that the herd is fiber too? Yeah, and that's a big thing. You know, there's because we. I, I think that's something to look at more because we're talking about multiple streams of fiber. There's obviously something that could go into raw textile, um, but we're also, we know there's a growing interest in the hempcrete and then the you know, cellulose derived from the, uh, the inner herd, um, et cetera, just as a starting point. So there are these two value streams that come from these fiber-based plants that are different than you know, the grain and different than the CBD. Let's you know, simply put, fiber plants, we're looking to plant them more densely, correct? And they grow taller. Um, can anyone want to tell us a little bit more about the season of like, what are we looking at when we're doing fiber? Uh, when do we plant it? What's the difference between, you know, a, a fiber and a, a grain production, uh, et cetera? Hey, that's my game. Uh, so uh, what's really great about hemp is that it is incredibly cold tolerant. So you can start your season as early as you can work the ground. Um, what is really crappy about hemp is that it is very water intolerant. So you have to keep your eye on how wet the soil is. And here in the Northeast, if we were just looking at temperature, we could plant hemp at the end of April. But because we, and this is for any variety, but because we have such wet springs and the water table is so high before we get to leaf on that um, we're really waiting for the soil to dry out. So as soon as your soil is dry enough and you're, I, I like to say you're about at field capacity where there is, uh, there is an excess moisture there, then you're ready to plant. And so it doesn't matter what the temperature is, it matters what the moisture is. And that's for whether you're plant any variety of hemp. If you're planting for grain, 
you're going to have a longer season and you're waiting for grain production, obviously. If you're planting for fiber, your season is much shorter and you're going to harvest somewhere around the last week of July, first week of, of August, because you're waiting for the vegetative stage to be complete and you want to catch it just as you're transitioning into that reproductive stage. So you probably have some pollen development. You probably don't have female flower development yet. And, um, and so that, so you have a short growing season, which is lovely. And yeah, what happens if, so we're harvesting earlier when we're talking fiber. And what happens if you wait too long? Like what happens if you harvest it later in the season? Well, so you can, it's just that what happens is that the fiber, as you transition into the reproductive stage, the stalk is preparing to hold all of that grain. The stalk is preparing to hold up all that weight. So the, the fibers get uh, thicker and coarser so that they, so that the stalk doesn't fall over when it has all the grain on it. So you have different, um, things that you can do with the fiber then it's considered not as high quality it can't be used in um in fabrics as well because it's not as high quality right but jared can talk to more about the quality change i think one of the things that uh that is generally seen with what jen's um speaking about is um in that transition time um the the fiber tends to have an increased lignin content and so the lignin kind of makes the, um, it's, it's the cellulose that really gives it the, um, the strength and the suppleness of the, of the bast fiber, that outer fiber portion. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. I don't know that there's a big difference in the herd, um, but basically as that, once that plant has kind of shot up and it's, it's at height and, you know, as Jen describes, it's preparing to, um, to hold that, you know, large seed um, volume it's going to, you know, basically the, it, 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 it uh, increases the lignin production, which changes and makes the, the fiber tend to not be as strong. Um, the fiber bundles um, are also uh, much more difficult to uh, kind of separate. So that goes back to that initial question a little bit, and I don't want to get totally sidetracked here, but the, uh, this is one of the areas where uh, hemp fiber in particular is is difficult to work with it, it is not a simple um you know you, there's no simple single machine um and steve can talk more about this than than i can um there's no simple single machine that's going to separate decorticate and get you down to fiber um in one step or even five steps um, that you can utilize in a textile in a rope or anything like that um, so maybe I'll let Steve talk about that for a second. Yeah, I, I also, I, I want to hear, just because Steve, you've done it and you've worked with Jen, um, how do we even get to the processing? So we've planted, we're getting ready for harvest. Can you tell us a little bit about the harvesting equipment process, you know, the baling, et cetera, and then, yeah, let's dive into that. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, again, I talked about fiber being harvested like uh, traditional agricultural commodities. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy because I think the first uh, the first field that I tried to harvest, I brought a disbine in there, which is, you know, great for hay, but awful for hemp. Um, it, uh, it wound up along everything. And I mean, it was it was a bad mess. I think I had to have um, uh, grinding wheels and stuff to get the hemp fibers out of out of the inside of that machine. So, um, you know, a, a sickle bar mower works really well, the old school sickle bar mower to uh, to cut it. Um, sickle bar. You know, yeah, sickle bar, the old, old. No, but wait, so the, the, I know what that means, but just like yeah. there's a few people, so you're talking low, low to the ground to the side of the tractor cutting. Yeah, 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 like the, the old drop down uh, seven to nine foot uh, to cutter. There's no crimping, no no conditioning. Um, and then, uh, you know, it needs to be turned over. I've I've had pretty good luck with, uh, with a rotary rake. Um, so it, it'll spin around and throw the hemp out, but I take the apron off the side so it won't make a windrow. It'll just flip the flip the hemp over, um, and then uh, you know you you turn it over about once a week. It kind of depends. Um, I mean, really having a good good contact with your processor because then you know you know what they want, what the end uh, end product is going to be, what they're looking for, um, and then really just rake it and round bale it. Um, you know, the round bales are usually a four by five. Um, you know, I I like to use a twine twine baler. I know that Jen uses the um, 
the net, uh, the net roller, um, you know, and, and I mean, her bales are, are beautiful. So um, I, I think that either one works well, it kind of depends on how you're going to store it. Um, you know, one, one big question that I get asked is the, uh, the logistics. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that say that, you know, the big square bales versus the, the round bales. I mean, yeah, you can fit a lot more, um, a lot more tonnage on a truck or a semi if you're moving those large square bales. But, um, you know, like my process, uh, we're shooting for more of like a, a high grade or textile grade. So the longer lengths of fiber work a lot better. So those round bales, it's wrapping the fiber, you get longer lengths. Uh, it's a lot easier to process that way. Um, let's see, I, I got all excited about the baling. And uh, where, what else were we gonna talk about? <laughs> My kids are distracting me downstairs. <laughs> I, I think, you know, the process, you know, getting it from, you know, the field to mm -hmm. eventually, you know, a sellable commodity. Right. So, I mean, like, like I said, I mean, you know, having a good contact with your, with your processor is really good. Like I said, I, I like the round bales. Um, it makes it, it's more valuable in my eyes. So I'll pay more for it if it's baled properly or if it's, if it's redded properly. Uh, which is that process of flipping flipping it over. I don't think we touch base about the the redding process. Um, you know, it, basically it's to where bacteria will get in there. I'm sure Jared or John will say the technical term, um, but uh, the bacteria gets in there and it makes the it releases that fiber from the herd or the. I see Jared smiling at me. I'm waiting for the the comeback on that one. <laughs> um, you know, but well, the funny thing is, Steve, I would say the exact same. I would say the exact same thing. I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not a biologist. Yeah. No. I. I don't know. I'm. I'm just a farmer trying to make a living. Um, you know, and um, so, uh, you know that that makes it a little bit more value to me, like you said, and then I I can process it. And then yeah, I mean, there's there's so many machines. It's uh, it's ridiculous. Like like Jared had mentioned. Um, you know, we we have a decorticator. Um. There's a couple of processes that we've done in-house. Um, you know, I, I mentioned about building this uh, prototype decorticator. Um, it, it's kind of an interesting machine. I, I really hope that we have it up and running. I really want to do videos and stuff on YouTube. Um, but we kind of uh, in, we kind of encompassed about three machines to go into one. So it would clean that fiber and card that fiber. Uh, so we'd really be able to separate that and get it ready for the textile end. But, you know, um, I actually just had a conversation with someone earlier uh, that's, that's buying a decorticator and, and really knowing what the end process is, because like my, my decorticator might work better for the textile and industry if we're going for, you know, the fiber. But uh, if someone's going for plastics or, you know, the non-woven non uh, mats or, you know, even, even for shorter hairs, you know, the angel hairs, um, you know, it, it, it kind of all, or the angel fiber, you know, it all, it all really depends. So, I mean, not all decorticators are created the same and uh, not all processes are the same. On that note, uh, Jake, I'll let you take it next, but like where in the world are we looking to, to get, you know, our, our best practices? You know, um, there was a, a question that was put out, you know, what about Romanian equipment for fiber left from the Soviet technologies? You know, it's like, where, what is, what's, where can we get our reference? Who's leading um, how do we not reinvent the wheel? And it's also, you know, uh, it's probably not so simple as just borrowing ideas or equipment from another country. Well, so there's a whole lot that's still happening in Eastern Europe. Um, and in, in Poland, they can take it straight from the bale to yarn. And so that equipment is out there, it's being used, it's up and running. And the other is China. In China, they're doing a ton of fiber work. And so we can look to, to Eastern Europe, we can look to China for what they're doing. I want to take a step backward for a second and go back to redding because we can't just stop. Like you, you, you grow the plant and then you cut it and then it doesn't magically go into bales, right? That redding process can make or break your product, right? And so um, it's incredibly important to have even redding, right? And all redding really is, is microbial decomposition. You're just letting the microbes get out the plant to start breaking it down uh, so, that the, so that the bast fibers will pull off of the herd more easily. But if you don't turn the, uh, the harvest often enough, right? And so we're looking somewhere around a, a week. If we don't 
um, watch out for excess moisture, you're going to end up with uneven redding where parts of the harvest are going to start breaking down much quicker than other parts will. And as you bail it, then you're going to have a mess. An overly redded material is useless. You're going to use it for bedding and that's about it. And so uh, it's really important to keep an eye on that stage. And so you're cutting somewhere around the last week of July, first week of August, and then every five to seven days, you're turning it with that rotary rake for somewhere around three to four weeks. It depends on moisture, it depends on rainfall, it depends on temperature, and then you come through and bale. And so keeping your eye on it and making sure that you're in that field and you're looking, this is the only part of the process where you have to be more hands-on than any other field crop. That you really, it, you know, um, it is most similar to hay, but then we're just talking about a couple of days, not a couple of weeks in the field. So I think that it's just important to know that that's, that's a piece of the game that we can't ignore. Yeah, I, this is incredible. I mean, you know, and, and what it opens up is something that I find as I'm growing 30 acres this year, I grew 10 acres last year. And as a grower, I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to do with my crop? And you know, what I want to do with it, you know, might not line up with what Steve wants to do with it. And, and so, you know, figuring out how to connect to that. Um, so, I mean, you know, kind of the, an, uh, an obvious question in my mind is, uh, you know, what are the low hanging fruits, Steve, you know, what are some uh, markets that you're, you're looking at? Um, and, and what are ways, uh, I mean, you know, we might not go to the highest level textiles originally, you know, but is there some stepping stones that, you know, people can take now? Right. So, I mean, um, there, there's so many uses for, for that fiber. And I mean, as a, as a processor there, you know, there are some of those, those low hanging fruits that, that are a little bit easier to accomplish. You know, um, uh, I noticed that someone uh, mentioned a question about construction, um, you know that it the herd is is really highly sought after in uh, in hempcrete. Um, you know, someone had mentioned biochar. That's that's a reasonably well. I don't know. I was going to say it's kind of a simple process, but it's really not. I mean, biochar is really an art because I've I've messed up biochar plenty of times. You know, I mean, it's really something you have to watch. But um, you know, it, it it's hard. It, really any any low hanging fruit i guess would be like something that you're good at you know i mean i see a lot of people that are trying to get into the industry um and they're and they're trying to do what other people are doing you know but um really focusing on what you're good at and what your area expertise is i mean i have a farming background so you know we've been doing research with making fertilizer out of out of hemp you know doing animal feed uh we did make bedding for a little while um you know, and then biochar has been a fun one because that's a soil amendment, you know, but, and that's, that's all things that I'm interested in, you know, and, it, and it's things that worked well for me. So it's, it's hard to really say what would work well for everyone. I know what works well for me, you know. Jacob, uh, you're muted. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that was one thing um, that, you know, was interesting for me from a grower and, you know, we, we went back and forth with a few emails about this is, is the seed genetics. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, in the conversation is, is pretty ripe in the, you know, in the CBD area, but, you know, there's not a lot of people talking about fiber genetics and, you know, I've now had four or five different genetics over the last two years. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering how that's all playing into this supply chain that we're going through now. It's like, you know, are the seed genetics lining up with what the farmers want, lining up with what the processors want? Or, I mean, I, I'm growing a dual purpose variety right now for, you know, fiber. So, you know, can you, it can, I'd uh, love to hear speak to the seed genetics. So can I just say that the reason you don't hear people talking about seed genetics in the fiber side is because the conversation is all about harvest and not about fiber quality, because we have no idea well, first of all, we don't know what affects fiber quality yet. And we also don't know how one variety differs. We don't know what quality means, right? So because there are so many different uses for the fiber that one set of genetics, we, we don't know if it's gonna be better than another set. It, it depends on what you're going for and what the end use is gonna be. But right now, the most important 
question to ask is how are you going to harvest and that's going to determine what variety you want to grow because do you want to end up with an 11 foot plant or do you want to end up with an eight foot plant right because an 11 foot plant is significantly more difficult to cut with a sickle bar mower um unless there are all sorts of really neat ones that we want to build that look totally dangerous and not user friendly or OSHA approved or anything that have multiple bars so that when you're coming through and cutting it cuts at, dip, at, at two or three levels so that instead of having an 11 foot plant you'll have you know three foot sections or or you know five to five foot sections or something like that um, much easier to to manage and to deal with and so that's where the the genetics portion is with fiber industry right now. We hope to be able to have more information, you know, moving forward. So the, can, I, can I add one? Sorry, Zach. No, go for it. No, so uh, Jen and I, um, through, through this pandemic, I was fortunate that my research group was able to get one last uh, group of um, of data gathered before uh, we, we walked away from campus in March. And that, that those data happened to be um, the 2019 uh, grow that Jen did. Um, and so we compared that to 2018 and Jen was looking at um, uh, fertilizing uh, nitrogen content. Um, and I'm, I'm butchering this, Jen, but you can, you can bail me out in a minute here. No pun intended. Um, the, um, the takeaway, the unexpected finding that, that we saw in our discussion um, a week or two ago was that genetic, genetics are um, significantly more important to the end result of the fiber properties that you get than we thought. We figured that hemp is hemp is hemp. That is not showing to be the case at all. And so while I agree that Jen is absolutely right and that's, you know, we are focused on, we're either focused on getting as much fiber as we can, which means we want to grow the tallest plant that we can. And I get that, that makes sense. Um, or we're focused on, you know, um, harvesting. But I think that the key factors that really are going to drive the end use are going to be genetics and redding. Those are the two key processes or two key steps that I think are going to be the, the, the first order, the major knobs that we have to turn and figure out to get an end use. And that's going to be, you know, the difference between things such as non-wovens to textiles to, um, you know, uh, filler, right? And I, going back to the original question, I think one of the biggest um, or the, perhaps the lowest hanging fruit in all this is um, short fiber filler material, replacing plastics with uh, these natural fiber materials directly. Not a ton of processing, not making them into bioplastics right away, but replacing things like polypropylene um, and, and offsetting some of those large scale uses um, in, the, in the near term. So uh, kind of a lot Dude, right there, but- Keep uh, going with that. What, what are some, so what are, what are some fibers that are being used to replace polypropylene right now and how can hemp enter that market? Like what's an example? Um, there's an example that uh, um, Sunstrand was pursuing um, before they shut down, um, which uh, basically it was with um, an automotive supplier um, where they were um, replacing glass fibers with, and so it was short fibers. We're talking um, less than, you know, on the order of millimeters. Um, and so basically dropping that in to reinforce um, a polypropylene, for example. And so what ends up happening is that, uh, you know, if you have a 20% um, fiber and 80% um, polypropylene, um, you're going to end up with a stronger, stiffer plastic material than you were if, would if it's just the pro polypropylene. Um, and so uh, there are opportunities where you can actually use hemp, let's say, um, and similar fiber length. Um, the beauty of hemp is that in this case is that it's not much stronger than, um, than glass, but it's half the weight. So you can put that 20% in and all of a sudden you've reduced the weight of the overall piece. To get the strength, 
you can actually, that you would get from the glass, you can actually bump up the fiber volume to say 30%, which means you're actually then reducing the weight of the overall part further to make it stronger um, and, and stiffer uh, and so forth. And so you're offsetting, um, you know, not only the, the glass fiber material, but an additional 10%. Um, let's say, and these numbers are, you know, please don't write, don't quote me on these numbers. They're not, um, they're not exactly right. They're pretty close though. Um, and so those, those are uh, the opportunities that, uh, that I, I was referring to, Zach. No, that's great. And it's interesting because one of the, the, the first, the 2018 Hemp Lab we had, had uh, where your colleague Ron Busenel came and spoke, you know, one of the most profound statements he said is like, hemp competes with fiber, you know, fiberglass. It, it, it competes with fiber-based glass. And that's a, that's a great example on a simple level. And yeah, we've definitely seen, you know, car parts coming out of Europe that are infused, you know, with, with the hemp-based. And it's, yeah, you hear it's lighter and it's more durable. And that, that's super interesting. That's a great low-hanging fruit uh, to hear. Yeah. I, uh, I would love to, to tap into that a little bit, um, you know, and, and one curiosity that I've been having and, and one that um, a, a good buddy of, of mine that uh, Maddie Mead from Hempitecture is the codes. So, you know, the, if, if we're talking about hemp replacing, you know, some of these heavily engineered materials, you know, those materials have been heavily engineered to a T. And now we're talking about hemp and, you know, we just talked about, you know, the whole hemp is hemp is hemp, you know, how's it red? And, you know, I, I just, I, I've already seen it with code enforcement officers and hempcrete. Um, and I can imagine as we start getting more and more engineered. Uh, so, I mean, you know, Jared, you have a lot of experience working with natural fibers, but if, if y'all all want to want to speak to, you know, kind of that, um, that quandary that, that's going to be happening. You guys want me to go first or go ahead, Jen? You're ready to go. <laughs> I, so I, I don't know that I'm ready to go. I think that that's, you there. <laughs> but that, that, that's exactly the research that we're working on, right? That's exactly what we're trying to figure out is um, what is the, the variability? What, it, what impacts different fiber uh, properties so that we can say, okay, we've had this, is, this variety has gotten this fertility and we had this moisture regime during the growing season. What qualities can we expect of that fiber so it is directed towards the appropriate end use? And I don't know that we have that information at our fingertips yet. That is the research that we're working on to be able to, to do that and to say that so, that so that we can work with the engineering community who expects very specific specifications on their products to say, yes, this meets your needs. Now, Jared can correct me. I don't, I don't have any correction there. You're absolutely right. I think you, you said it beautifully. Um, I think that's where the, the relationship that, you know, Jen and Steve and I have is critical. Right, and that's where um, organizations like Hemp Lab and so forth, where um, I mean, this is, these materials are unique. There are whole, um, you know, uh, infra, huge steps in the process that are are different. You know, with fiberglass, there's a company that makes it, right? One company makes it, another company takes it and weaves it, and then they sell it and it goes and gets used. This starts as seed. Well, the seed actually comes from somewhere, but I, I don't know anything about that. And then, um, then the seed gets sold to the farmer. This farmer puts the seed in the ground, et cetera. You, you, and then there's the whole discussion of, of redding and baling, and then how do you get it to the processor? And then what does the processor do with it? And oh yeah, what happens if it's a rainy year as opposed to a dry year? Um, the, the analogy that comes to my mind is, as an engineer is to think about the early days of concrete. You know, it wasn't known at first that you had to change your mixture based on temperature, right? And as temperatures changed, um, as environments changed, you had to change your mixture um, to get different, different properties and different end results. Um, you reinforce it, you know, for different things, uh, different, you use rebar in different ways, et cetera. So you, um, we are in that stage right now where we need to understand what are all these inputs and how do they affect that output so we can assess what is the performance that this material is capable of. 
Yeah, so I, I kind of wanted to add on that a little bit because, um, you know, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're trying to start up a facility or we just bought a 12,000 square foot facility. And, you know, um, I, I've talked pretty closely with code enforcement and we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, all, all the, the hoops that we have to jump through. And um, it, it's interesting because code enforcement is asking me questions as far as uh, hempcrete goes. I mean, there's a little bit of information. There's there's some new fire codes that came out that are that are geared around hemp. There are, you know, new new codes that are that are for the hemp industry and also for building, you know, building codes. But it, it really is just a lack of information. You know, I mean, um, like, uh, you know, there, there were concerns with starting up some of the machines that we have and, um, you know, and, it, and it's tough because they, they ask questions that haven't been asked before, you know, I mean, it, and, and, it, and it's hard because that research hasn't been done. So really it's in-house research. And, you know, I, I noticed that someone asked a question about, you know, funding for research and, you know, we're, we're all trying to do research. I mean, I know Jared, Jen and I, I mean, Zach, Jacob, we, we've all kind of worked on, on grants either together or separately. Um, you know, and I mean, it's, it's hard because it seems like we get more uh, decline letters than we get, you know, acceptance or funding for a lot of the stuff that we want to do. You know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many letters I get that say your proposal is awesome, but no, you know, so um, we're, we're trying to do the best that we can, you know, in that research. But yeah, I mean, it's even when we're trying to, uh, you know, I, I was trying to work with a paper manufacturer to start selling our herd for, uh, for paper. I mean, it was a local paper mill. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, they might know the specs that they want for something that's made out of wood, but they don't know what their specs are for hemp. We have to tell them that. I mean, so really we have to reverse engineer what they're making and tell them what they want. So, I mean, there's just, there's so much research that needs to be done, done in this industry. You know what I mean? It's, it's fine because it's comparable to other stuff, but it's not the same as, you know, just like in the growing process. Yeah, it's, it's similar to growing hay, but it's not the same as growing hay. So looking, appreciate all that perspective and beginning to look at the, the Q and A's. Um, can you all see those? Um, there's definitely a couple of interesting questions in there. Um, speaking to Jessica Hafton, um, she's out south of Buffalo. Uh, she's, they're going the third season of growing for grain and fiber. Uh, they've managed to find a market for their grain the past two seasons, but have yet to find a market for fiber. Um, what is the marketplace looking like? And I think it'd be interesting to hear, you know, breaking it, the ideal per acre, you know, I'm, I'm, I am curious too about cost, like input cost per acre, but maybe more looking specifically like, yeah, what, what can you expect to pull off an acre from a yield? And is there an existing market today? I know you've been doing a lot of work on that, Steve, and happy to hear from anybody. Yeah, so, um, hi, Jessica, how are you doing? I, I actually know her reasonably well, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, it, it's tough. I wish there were more fiber processors, you know, um, to be honest with you, I, competition breeds business, you know what I mean? There's only so much that CNY hemp processing can do. And there's, there's only so much that, that any one company or one person can do. I mean, we're, we're still trying to grow. The industry is still trying to grow. Um, you know, I mean, we, we try to do the most that we can, but, you know, really having, um, only a certain radius that we can buy fiber makes things kind of difficult. That's why we're trying to expand across the state um, into into other locations or even having well, what subsidiaries. What we consider a reasonable radius, just for, for context. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's that's okay. I mean, there's there's so many different numbers out there as far as what people uh, say that would be you know financially feasible. Um, in my experience, you know, I, I might say 50 miles for fiber, um, you know, grain might be 150 miles. Um, it, it, it's tough. I mean, like I said, the logistics can get kind of expensive. I mean, when you're, when you're spending, you know, if, if your cost, you know, to grow, um, grow the fiber and harvest the fiber might be $350 an acre. When it costs you $350 additionally to truck that to a processor, it doesn't make it financially feasible. You know, I mean, it would be nice to um, to see some smaller facilities or bigger facilities come in. Um, you know, I, I really think that one one big thing that's kind of held back the industry is um, 
you know, hemp being illegal for so many years. I mean, if you look at the time frame that that hemp was made illegal, 1937, you know, it's, um, you know, that that was kind of a pivotal time for agriculture. You know, I mean, there were a lot of family farms that had a few cows and they were learning, you know, I mean, they were the ones that were doing all the research. They'd go out and say, you know, uh, this hay, my, you know, my cows produce more milk on this hay, you know, or they start, uh, you know, making their own cheeses or, the, or they, they, you know, they press their own soybeans, you know, I mean, there, there's, you know, I mean, there's so many things that were done. And the fact that it was illegal for so many years, these farmers uh, didn't have the opportunity to be there to, to do that research, you know, on the farm. So it'd be nice to see some small farm, farm operations to be able to, uh, you know, do that. I mean, maybe small decorticators in, in farms and in barns across the state would really help because, you know, that would make them more profitable because then they're, they're selling fiber and herd. And I believe once upon a time, you actually could pay your taxes in hemp fiber. So, you know, that, that uh, decentralized decortication is huge. Um, so I, I want to uh, ask another one from the, from the Q and A. Um, so this one is for Steve as well. Uh, has, has CNY hemp processing reached out to tribal governments in New York state? Um, basically this person's been for a year attempting to convince chiefs to start a hemp based economic revival plan. Um, I mean, I guess just the overall, the conversation have, have you reached out or talked with any tribal governments about hemp growing? Um, you know, at, at this time, uh, I haven't. Um, I would not be opposed to that whatsoever. Um, I guess I just, um, I, don't, I don't know where I would begin on that one. And I, but I do think that uh, that would benefit um, agriculture and, you know, benefit the industry. Um, you know, I, there's, a, there's kind of a general email address, uh, information at cnyhempprocessing.com. You know, that's a pretty, pretty good asset. We also have the toll free number 833-247 hemp. Um, you know, there's, I, I, we're always willing to talk. Uh, sometimes with the renovations and expansion, it's been a little hard it's kind of playing phone tag a little bit with people, but we're trying to do the best we can. Well, if you're, if you're open to it, Steve, we'll, we're happy to share that with, uh, with your, your contact information. And Jen, uh, yeah, if you've got any thoughts too. So, um, I, I had someone from one of the some one of the northern uh, New York uh, tribal communities contact me and got really mad that I wouldn't work with them. And the reason I wouldn't work with them was because it was too many hours of a drive for my students to make it there. And um, and what I was trying to explain to them was that they didn't need me, that I was happy to help and ask questions, but they didn't need to be a part of my program. They could get their own permits and grow. But I want to be really careful about what we suggest hemp can do. Hemp is a crop, mm -hmm. and it's a crop that is wonderful to incorporate into our rotations. It is going to save nobody's farm. It is going to save nobody's economy. It is not a gangbusters, you're going to make millions of dollars ordeal. It's awesome. I think it's a really fun plant. I love learning about it. I love working with it. But to suggest that incorporating one new plant into any crop rotation all of a sudden is going to cure economic woes is really false and is something that I hear a lot in the hemp community and we need to be very careful about that because it's just not true. Yeah I appreciate you sharing that and you know we've seen it in New York State and we've seen it in other states as well um, and you know speaking of uh, you know kind of this this, I mean, somewhat booming market, you know, with, with CBD and, you know, all these CBD processors are, you know, ending up with a lot of fiber material at the end of it. So, I mean, this is a classic question. Um, you know, is, is there a fiber processing market for CBD stocks? So CBD stocks are predominantly herd and not bass fiber because there's so much thicker and so there there's a lot less surface area so the reason that you plant fiber crops on seven and a half inch rows at 40 pounds of seed per acre is because you want there to be competition and you want the plants to grow tall and thin because the the thinner the stock is the more bass fiber there is and the less herd there is so if you have a processor or you have a product in mind that requires herd 
then CBD stocks are awesome because you're getting proportionally much more. If you're looking for bast fiber, then CBD stocks are, are nearly impossible to decorticate and um, are not nearly as, as useful. Appreciate that. Um, so you know, we have about seven minutes left on, on the webinar. Um, and, and one thing that I, I really want to get from, from, from the group is, you know, what are some things that you're optimistic about in the next, uh, you know, 12 to 24 months um, with regards to hemp fiber? Um, I'll start. Um, so I think that um, I have optimism uh, based on the fact that I think we are starting to look at the right things. Um, I think that uh, I came into this with, um, you know, uh, quite a bit of ignorance. I still have a lot of ignorance. I'll be the first to admit it. But one of the things I was not aware of was how difficult it was going to be to get this material into products. Um, that is the key step that is needed. Um, and so Steve said a few minutes ago, right, we need to reverse engineer how, how these materials can go into uh, various products. And so a customer, you know, the paper com company that he mentioned, they don't know what they need from hemp. And so they're relying on um, him to come up with ways to, uh, to, to figure that out. Um, that is the gap that we need to cross right now. That's the gap that, you know, goes back to understanding the, the variation that Jen was talking about. That's what's going to drive the market. If we can figure out end uses, that's what's going to lead to, um, you know, farmers having a, a material that they can then sell um, and, and make a profit on. Until, until we have that, we're going to be in this kind of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, this, uh, this gray area where people are growing for fiber and they, at the end of the year, they're like, great, what do I do with this material? Um, and Steve, you know, can buy some of it, but, um, you know, it's, it, it, that, it, that's what's going to drive this process. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll hop on. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really optimistic in, um, you know, how, how the industry is kind of changing. I mean, in New York state, um, you know, there, there was a lot of hype around CBD. There's still a lot of hype around CBD and, you know, CBD is, is necessary for certain, certain things. Um, you know, but it, it does seem like there's more people that are switching over to the fiber fiber end. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. You know, I mean, the, uh, the amount of phone calls that I get and, uh, emails to, to switch over to fiber, um, is uh it, it, it's really great you know i mean we have kind of been chasing our tails um for a couple of years you know trying to figure out um exactly what our our end goal is or what our what our purpose is in the industry you know i've um i've been trying to build infrastructure i know i know jared has been and so is jen you know i mean i i hate to keep you know hitting that infrastructure but it, it's really important because that's the only way that this crop is going to be able to make it you know i mean being able to go, you know, from seed to farm, to truck, to processor, you know, to, to be able to come into that fruition of having, having an end product, you know, I mean, it's, um, it, it's definitely an, an interesting process, but I've, I've enjoyed the journey and I'm looking forward to what's coming over the next year to two years. Okay, so what I think I'm most optimistic about is uh, has almost nothing to do with the hemp industry it's, uh, itself. Um, I love hemp as a fiber crop because of the opportunities that it gives um, for soil health and agronomy. Because since we are harvesting at the end of July and then we're ready in the field and we're bailing, we're out of that field by the last week of August, which means that now, particularly central New York, upstate New York, this opens up the world of cover crops. And we can use multi-species cover crops, get biodiversity into our fields, that's really lacking in our traditional um, corn, soybeans, sometimes a couple of years of alfalfa hay in the middle rotations, right? We really get some great uh, biodiversity in there. 
improve soil health. And so it fits so well into our, our growing season here and into our crop rotations here that I, I really am just excited about getting your traditional farmers who don't think they want anything to do with hemp. This is their, this is their entry into having a, a hemp crop every three to five years and getting a really great cover crop on that soil. I love it. I love the high note. It's great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's one of the, one more question we got coming from Richard Glazer, who's a supporting member for Hemp Lab and big shout out to Richard. Um, yeah, how are we smarter than the stupid stuff predicted? Like, can't we educate, activate and innovate? And I think that really having conversations like this really, uh, uh, you know, sow seeds, literally. It's how we can begin to plan accordingly and begin to share knowledge that's rooted, it's grounded and it's connected. Um, and Hemp Lab's been really working hard to do that. and really bring in folks to the table such as yourselves who are willing to share constantly, like phone call, email. There's just always this openness that I think is really helping this industry move forward amidst, you know, a lot of the madness. And um, I just, I can't thank you all enough uh, for, for being here. Um, I also, yeah, want to be, give a big shout out to everyone who's in attendance. There's a lot of members, a lot of friends, and a lot of new faces out there. And someone who registered as COVID-19, which I don't know if is appropriate, but it's still pretty funny in this moment. Um, so as I opened up, uh, Hemp Lab is a registered 501c3 not-for-profit. We're member supported. Um, I just put a link in the chat that goes a link to our membership. Um, anything you can do, whether it's a donation or you want to be part of the community, um, that, and that means you can help shape this conversation and direct it by, by sharing your needs with us. It goes a really long way. Um, we're doing this because we love it. And the more people who are contributing, the more it is a community education platform. So um, just sharing that because, uh, yeah, we love Hemp Lab and we're, we're grateful for everyone who's supporting. And there's a bunch of new faces and it can't help but share and, and hope to expand the community. Um, yeah, I want to give everyone just another closing word if you want to uh, just, just to, to touch base. And yeah, Jared, Steve and Jen, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Um, it's busy life lives and kids and food. And uh, Jacob, as always, thank you so much for, for supporting. Thank you, Zach. Thanks for, uh, and everybody else. It's, uh, I appreciate being here. Great. Thanks. Yeah, it's always fun to actually get to have conversations with folks. So. True. so I'm just, you know, talking to my kids all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can second that one. It's it's really nice to see some uh, familiar faces. So and and thank you, Zach. You know for for inviting me and uh, you know Jared and Jen. As as usual, I learn something every time I talk to you. And and uh, you know I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to everything that's coming up and working together. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, great. Thanks. Cool. Well, everyone, Thanks, everybody out there. Um, you know, Hemp Lab's always open. If, you, if there's any remaining questions, text them, email them to Hemp Lab, and we'll share with the community. And uh, yeah, well, we're. I look forward to having the conversation with us five again sometime soon, maybe at the end of the season, to talk about what we learned this year. It'll be a great follow up. Cool. All right, everyone, take care, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Let's see ya. Well, I'm glad I didn't turn into a meme, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet anyway, Steve. Yeah, there's always time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made sure I wore pants, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, awesome. Thanks, guys. I'm going to go eat some supper. Yeah, yeah cool. me too. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Take Talk care. to you later. Yes. Thank Bye. you, Zach. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. See ya. See ya. Bye. Right. And that's a wrap.